Hello gang, welcome to Sketching with Izzy. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I, I still don't have the camera thing figured out as you can obviously tell. It's been a very, very busy couple of weeks. Please let me know if you can hear me guys. Great, thank you so much Irina. Welcome, welcome all. Good to see y'all. Uh, sorry about the camera thing. I think the camera thing is gonna carry through to the lesson, unfortunately. My only solution will probably be to get a webcam, um, the capture card. Uh, I cannot get the capture card to sync with the audio. I think it'll probably be better for when I wanna start doing uh, streaming of video games, which hopefully will be happening sometime in the near future. Um, but yeah, I'll be ordering a webcam and I, I really hope to have this sorted out by next week. So thank you guys for your patience and for bearing with me there. Anyway, uh, let's just get right into what I was thinking today. Um, after messing with the uh, with the camera and all that stuff, and after an exhausting couple of days of taxes, I just felt like doing something kind of, I don't know, very me, so I can relax and not be too fussy about it. And I was, I actually just happened to be uh, doing some testing with the, with the mic, and uh, when I moved over to the new computer, which I had to build a couple of weeks ago, um, I just copied over all of the files from all of my backups and I found all of these paintings that I had done from previous lessons all in my recordings bin which is where I keep everything uh, for our class so this these two paintings here were both done for class I believe um, I don't remember exactly what they were I think this one was photo bash class and this one I think was maybe a colors one or maybe that was just for fun I can't remember uh, but I saw her there and I was like, oh, that's a cool character. I forgot that I actually painted her. Um, so I just grabbed those two things, threw them in here and looked up a painting that I've always really loved of Sargent's. And I'm just going to do sort of a twisted version of that. So you're going to see me taking a character and possibly a creature. I'm not 100% if that thing's going to make it in. And then applying it to kind of a, a very specific style. So hi, Jay. Welcome. Hey, Dan Rob. So I'm just going to get into it. Uh, I wanted to kind of have an idea of where I was going to go, so I quickly sketched this while we were doing a little preamble. Um, I'm not entirely sure how close to this uh, costume I'll stick. Um, because there's a lot of this that just there's a lot of this that isn't designed for sitting, you know, the bustle and the things like that, and this, these heavy leather pieces. So I don't know exactly how much will will stay. There's a lot of rhythms that I like, uh, but I have a feeling that as this as this paints, because this is not an actual character, it's just sort of like this cool creature thing I made up. Uh, and I don't need to stay on model, which is one of the things I hate the most <laughs> in, in secret Izzy problems. Uh, I always struggle with keeping things on model. I, I always end up morphing them because I get bored painting the same thing again and again. So she'll, I, I guarantee you she'll evolve, but the essence of what is here and what is here, I'm hoping to capture and mix with what is here. So bear with me as we dig in and uh, feel free to chat amongst yourselves and ask any questions you like. This is a uh, chat and hangout group first, so I just happen to be painting while we're chilling. I'm doing a lot of just color picking from what's here. I doubt I'll keep the same skylight. I'm gonna probably do an interior uh, color key sort of not this one but something with that kind of lighting setup <laughs> oh thanks Dan Rob yeah I do appreciate hearing that I love him you know he's my brother we go way back um, we grew up together man and uh, he is he is a dream to work with he is, he is so fast, man. His ideation is incredible. Love that guy. Let's, uh, let's cool her off a little bit rather than going that really warm that we have there. What I had going on here, I can see I was playing the purples against the greens of the background. 
and that bluishness of the sky. And this time I want to dull that down and let her be the, not pale, but be, let her be a cooler color in respect to the scene. I'm kind of definitely going for like a, a it, it looks like the original idea didn't really reference it directly, but kind of a Cenobite, Hellraiser, comfort with discomfort kind of feel. So I got to figure out how to get that. I love the bunched up dress from the sergeant piece. I'm gonna try and keep that feel. I don't think I'll have her cross-legged. Cross, cross-legged. Cross but that kind of billowing seated skirt thing, you know, the quinceanera look is pretty cool. I'm going to be uh, messing with the anatomy a lot here, I can tell, uh, just so that things feel correct. There's I'm kind of after a certain regal feel. I'm gonna group these. Right now I'm just populating um, color and canvas. I'm not, I'm not yet sure about the lighting. I'm not yet sure about even the arrangement of the figure here. Let's uh, switch to another brush that can handle some swoops. Nope. And a little bit of speed here. Sometimes, uh, actually not sometimes, most of the time when I'm at this stage of a painting and it's going to be more of a, just a fun painting, <clears throat> I worry less about the, the look of the strokes because I know so much of it will be, end up being covered over and it's just about speed and getting things down. I got to decide where I want my, I, I kind of like the idea of having sort of a raking light source like we have here that will allow me to really kind of play with the face and, and her particular mask, which I really like. Um, I just got to decide where I'm going to have my light rake from. If she's looking into the light or looking away from the light. So it could be either way. You come from the left, come from the right. I don't know. What I do like is opportunities where cast shadows can kind of strike across a form. Her hood, no matter what, will create an opportunity with her face to create a cast shadow. But also, maybe I can do something where there's a cast shadow coming across shoulders or across arms, which would be cool. One of the ways I can make her skin feel cooler is by surrounding her by something 
that's ruddier, or with something that's ruddier, sorry. Let's uh, get rid of these for a second and just make some shapes. You don't want to get too caught up in your source stuff yet when you don't even have shapes going on. I definitely want this to be dark. This reminds me a lot of, uh, oops. This reminds me a lot of the uh, seated figure paintings I would do in school. Simple lighting structure, simple pose, just seated. One of the interesting things about her anatomy is, I remember I designed her to have uh, two sets of shoulders. So double clavicle, double shoulder blades, which is a really difficult design, but it's a fun challenge. Her breasts will definitely overlap this shape a bit, but right now I'm more concerned with making sure that the arms flow correctly. I'm trying to use as big a brush I can to describe. I'm gonna have to do something about this hood because it looks great in profile, but front on it, I don't think it's as cool. Out, make it shapey.
Okay, now that I've figured out some darks and mid-tones and I have a rough that kind of reads, I'm going to start just carving in lights. Much of skin lives in mid tones. Oh, thanks, Irina. Yeah, uh, I, I actually really like that original character, too. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how she, she comes out, especially since I don't have any of those original textures that I used in order to imply the costuming. So it'll all have to actually be painted. When we get to the end, we'll definitely do a big zoom in on her and uh, really get into the details, but I'm not entirely sure we'll get there today. This might be another uh, two or three day painting.
Yeah, I decided to just put her in there with the... Uh, we'll see. I may still cut it out uh, if, it, if it's too much of a distraction from the weirdness of her. Uh, she's the dominant figure in this. Uh, but I, I also liked that little critter. I thought it was pretty funny.
sometimes it helps when you have your little reference there. Just do a big one so I don't have to keep zooming in. You just turn it off and on then. Hmm. <laughs> oh man. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. That's so funny. Okay, now that the the main masses are put in, now it's time to kind of mess it all up. see this back yeah I agree uh, when you cover up the eyes, um, there, it leaves so much to be inferred, which is which is always a fun game to play with your viewer to engage that way. I need to give her some actual shoulder meats here, but I don't want to lose neck really important to me to keep that long weird neck I may even I think I'm gonna raise her face some more to kind of keep in the, the idea that that collar is restraining
Used to try painting by starting with shapes and color, but lost control of things too easily. So you make clear sketches before painting, makes you finish pieces more. No, uh, you, there is there is no exact right way to do this. I don't think you're missing out on anything. It's just about doing it uh, in ways that are comfortable or exciting for you at the time. Um, I enjoy the, the lost and found. I like the, the journey. Um, there, there's something that happens when you just do this long enough that you can kind of trust in, in the process and you'll know that no matter what, you'll have something at the end. It may not be what you intended exactly. It may not even necessarily be great, but you'll have something. And, uh, that's just, that just takes trust in, uh, in the things that you've learned. There is no, there's definitely no like process that I think is the only way to do things. And I, and as a result, uh, you're missing out on anything. Looks like I kind of had like a, a mush together, almost pumpkin-y shape. A pumpkin -y shape. Which is kind of in keeping when you think about uh, um, deltoids in general. They're very weird muscles. I definitely think that part of what made the character work was the weird buxomness of her. She is just overtly built. So we're going to we're going to take it there and see how it looks. We may have to bring it back a little bit for a seated position. You think practicing in shapes color directly maybe just as studies will help make difficult changes in your pieces down the line makes it easier to fudge with your piece instead of having to start over with the line yeah that's true um you'll find uh, what i find is i tend to do both so i'll start really rough and big and then as i refine and i realize that something needs to something isn't working like i know that i'm going to have to go in and draw her face i know i'm going to have to go in and draw these arms and especially the hands um but what I like about starting with the shapes personally, not to, not to argue that it's the way to do it, but what I like about it is that you get surprised sometimes by the things that you discover and you end up making decisions you, you probably hadn't originally planned. Especially when it comes to light and shape. And the cool thing is, is that every now and then you'll, you'll make shapes or a stroke that just works. And then the goal is to just find a way to protect that as long as you can so you're not uh, erasing the good stuff you've done. You may have noticed that, I'm, I'm not sure if it's directly translating, but that I've slowed down a bit. I'm not just sort of whipping around. That's that. Starting to really think about what what I have here and what to do with it so speak of the devil I think I'm gonna have to do a little bit of drawing right now in order to oops in order to figure out this chest and it's just not quite working yet so it doesn't hurt to make a new layer and then pick a very different color and then just figure it out just hash it out
part of what let's get the big one back so i think part of what i wanted to do here with this primary binding shape is to really imply that titan structure of, of being bound up here so pinching all the flesh and i think that that absolutely keep is in keeping with the shapes that i chose and how big she is so i want to kind of capture that but in a seated position so that means kind of bunching things up vertically too half expect there to be an insect or arachnoid body under her desk dress absolutely <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, Irina with the with the head pose by combining these two figures, she's already kind of regal in this one, but the idea that uh, this creature of such horror just kind of is dominating the scene, I think there's something to it that's kind of fun. Keep that roughly the same. Allow the fat to kind of billow a little bit. A little bit of um, muffin topping here. I think I had this problem with the original where that that distant shoulder needs to be somewhat obfuscated by the the smaller inset one. Something about the bound lower arms makes me want to spread her arms just like I did with the original. So maybe there's something to like just having that little bit of room. And I think maybe that helps with that insectoid appearance, right? Is having that line like that. So maybe she's snuggling her little pet here. I think the uh, the length of the limbs and the, and the relationship between the forelimb and the upper limb and so on are also adding to that insectoid feel. Colors, of course. I like that pop-out shoulder elbow that the uh, sergeant has, so I wanna actually follow that. Definitely by widening, I think I faced this also, widening those shoulders. I need to get the width of the outer shoulders to feel natural to the figure as is. So instead of redrawing all of the shoulders, what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll shrink the canvas again.
Okay, so now I can, now that I've drawn that and kind of figured out where I want to go with that, we can uh, lower the opacity and then do another quick paint pass just to get the lights in. Let's see, more questions? I love how it's low key lit, no bright highlights, but doesn't over, isn't overly dark. Yeah, so that's where I'm kind of um, trying to stick a little bit more to Sargent here, where a lot of the magic that happens on flesh in particular, but in these portrait shots is in the midtones. So it's very purposeful. Uh, there will be more directional light as, the, as I start building out the forms and rounding them out. I tend to try to get, um, I try to map out where I'm gonna go and then I'll start pushing the lights and pushing the darks a little bit just to uh, illuminate the figure better. If, if it goes, it, sometimes it can go too far. I can make it too bright, but we'll try and keep it in, that, in this mid-tone range. I'm very much digging your analysis, Irina. That's great. Oop. I'm getting some uh, some hiccups for some reason. Hopefully, that's not translating to you guys. I think this will be good popping the arm out like this too because then we can really accentuate the contours here. I think from the get-go, definitely, I've always seen this character, as soon as I started drawing her from before, as, as a creature of great power. I think, I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I think I was kind of making a goddess of some kind or some kind of powerful spirit. I don't remember. using lights to play against darks in order to create greater contours.
<laughs> yeah. Definitely got some Cersei going on. Cersei? Cersei going on? I forgot her name. It's been that long. Was Game of Thrones ever a thing? Alright. Whoops. Somebody's been cutting and pasting. <laughs> You're wise. I stuck through to the end. Oh, damn. That sounds like my experience with the books uh, for Game of Thrones. When they hit the Red Wedding in the books, I just put it down. I stopped reading because I knew there was no way that the, that the setup, that the payoff could match the setup. I, I realized then that it was counting on basically horror fatigue. Like just waiting for, you know, continuing the story so that... And, and introducing crazier and more over-the-top things that, like, they wouldn't... Ha it was a lot, like, lost in that effect for me. And that they just kept amping up the violence, amping amping up the setup, and, and the, the, the need for that revenge. And I knew there was no way that they could ever pay all of that off. Okay, so now I need to do some major loss and found here. I'm doing stuff that Sergeant absolutely preached against, but did all the time. Using a soft brush to uh, soften edges instead of painting the edges in. Majorly frowned upon by the man. Damn, that sounds heavy, Arena. Okay, so that's our lightest light, roughly. Let's bump that up a little bit. I'm kind of curious what green will do here. So 
looks like I definitely had more shoulder space and verticality. Yeah. I keep adding it and then somehow it gets lost. It's really important. I, I think uh, it, when you're making an effort to paint breasts more naturally is to make sure that the placement is accurate. It's so common for artists to place them very, very high and not have pectorals uh, visible. It becomes a symbol of of uh, the breast rather than a an accurate representation of one. Uh, I don't currently have uh, an art book plan. I have done a couple of things. I did a book actually with Peter Hahn uh, a number of years back called Thought Gun Shells, uh, Volume 1. And that one was an IP development uh, book. So it was a bunch of art and a shitload of stories and cool stuff like that that we did together. Um, and then I did, I helped build the God of War book. So the God of War Ascension book uh, that came out, I think, seven years ago, which is huge and gold edged and everything. I think it's one of the best looking uh, video game art books on the planet, personally. Not to toot my own horn, uh, but that book uh, I had a big hand in and it's got a ton of my art for artwork in too. But personal work, not so much. Um, I was told I need to get a bigger following uh, before I can do a, a Kickstarter for that. So that's going to be, that's basically kind of part of what all of this is, is that someday I can actually do something that will have, that will, ha that will have enough support to actually get off the ground. Um, but based off of just how my Patreon is doing and, and how Twitch numbers have been, I don't see it happening anytime soon. If you would like to uh, <laughs> speed that up for me, absolutely please share uh, links and experiences if you enjoy what I do here. That would make all the difference for me, man. It's so easy. Because, because the shapes have to be just exactly perfect, it's so easy to spend basically like 99% of your time painting boobs <laughs> and I don't like doing that. I try to get it done with quickly so it doesn't look like I'm just sitting there fetishizing. But unfortunately this creature kind of has that as an element even. It's interesting, it kind of looks like, from a distance, it just looks like possibly a really badly painted pregnancy. <laughs> I think, yeah, the problem here really is the seated position. It's just not, she's not conducive to, see, to being seated, and I think that's what's happening. So what I'm going to have to do is just change the, I can't follow the anatomy of the standing figure that much anymore and start taking bigger risks of, on that. Oops. I would very much like to at at some point get to, get to the point where I'm just making stuff and that's what I that's what actually makes my living feeds the dog um, 
I, I like doing illustrations for wizards and things like that, and, and doing my concept art assignments, but if people dig this stuff, the only way I can really uh, support just doing crazy, weird paintings and teaching and things like that is to have more online uh, presence. wish I had some reference for this part. <laughs> How was my experience living on the boat? How did that help me grow as an artist? Great questions. Uh, the boat was a mixed bag, man. Uh, it was uh, it was really fun. It was a hell of an adventure. At times it was super scary. Other times crazy boring. Um, I think it helped in terms of in terms of the art side of things, it really helped to readjust my expectations of what a career in art should should feel like and what life playing out should feel like. Um, there's, a, there's this great impetus in, in our cultures to kind of lay down on the on the millstone and just be ground to bits making these things um even as an artist uh especially as a commercial artist there's this there's just a, this huge push for um you know making products uh being on projects that are super important uh it's, it's fortune and glory which makes sense and I, and I get it, um, but I think, and, and I've talked about this before in, in classes and, and in, in, in lectures at shows and things like that, where uh, you, you really need to personally define for yourself what uh, success is. I was saying I gotta mute my damn phone. Um, by, by being, by being out there and, and being only accountable to myself, it really had, it really kind of made that strike home that, that idea that you're accountable for your own happiness, you're accountable for your own, uh, satisfaction, your definition for a good life lived, that's entirely on you. And, uh, you can't. If, if you follow somebody else's definition for what that is, especially the culture at large, uh, you may end up wasting your life. Now we all need to make money. We all need to put food on the table. We all got to support our families. Um, I'm not saying just sit on a park bench and do nothing, but how we choose to spend our time is super important because it's the only it's the only resource uh, that you can't ever make back you can make money again but uh, time no perfect perfect uh, sort of analogy for this I've actually seen and I, I may have mentioned this as, also as well I'm, I'm always afraid of just being that guy that just repeats his stories again and again but uh, uh, I remember uh, cruisers that were get, that that had bought their boats much like I had. Uh, old in this case was an old guy who had he had saved up. He'd worked at a you know worked in an office his whole life and had saved up because he was going to go on this nautical adventure and do what I was doing basically. Um, he'd bought the the awesomest boat. He he planned it all out. Um, and then when he got to Mexico and was actually working on his boat, uh, he had a heart attack. 
Um, you spend all your life trying to earn money so that you can have time to enjoy it, <laughs> but then you don't have the health to enjoy that time. So it's this, it's this awful rat wheel they have us running in. And by they, I mean just, you know, kind of the, the corporo, corporate capitalist mindset. Just, it just grinds you up. I also learned a lot from the Mexicans in general, the Mexican people. Uh, you know, family is so important there culturally. It's, it's, and it, this is really common with uh, Latin-based cultures. But I think it's, it's, you can see it in a lot of different places. But where I'm from in the U.S., uh, family doesn't have that same kind of punch it's not it's not the be and end all not all decisions are built around that um whereas in mexico that is the case and uh you know there sacrifices are made for the family that uh you just don't see in in what i would call sort of more american based culture time is that time spent together is huge it's not just family, like friends, too. Same thing. Yeah. Obviously, that can, that can end up corrupted, too, and end up dominating your entire existence so much that, you know, you can't do anything else. Uh, you, you have to do, sacrifice everything for family, and I don't think that's necessarily the way to go either, personally. Uh, obviously, I'm pretty estranged from mine. But, um, I don't know. Really, it just comes down to that concept of the one resource. It's a resource that's completely impossible to replace. You get one life uh, in terms of flesh, providing you believe you're one of those folks that believe in an afterlife. Uh, not me, but that makes me just want to live life all the, all the more excitingly. Relationships are huge, man. No question. I don't know where I'm going with this thing. I think one of the things I allowed to happen was speculars to kind of dominate those forms so that I didn't have to spend all this time um, just softening and softening and softening. I really don't want to do that. sessions big time uh that was one of the greatest experiences ever for me before i moved onto the boat having to get rid of everything it was so eye-opening just not having stuff that's one of those things i've managed to hold on to as, as a life lesson um only the things only the things that i need to do what i do do i spend time and money on giving myself little notes here right now that I kind of want uh, some kind of cool bounce light. Oh, man. Oh, you want to do yourself a favor just for your, the rest of your life? Do everything you can to completely cut marketing out of your life. Holy shit, what a difference that's made for me. I, I watch, I see, I have found a way to completely block out commercials and, and most marketing in such a way that when it breaks through, it's actually kind of novel. I'm <laughs> like, oh, wow, look at that. I've managed to completely cut it out. It's been great.
in that same vein of what I was just talking about in regard to time, uh, one of the big sins I, I discovered about myself is that I was so obsessed with making these projects that like would, would change the world or, you know, have some kind of impact and have, you know, that have that be a legacy. And then when I finally started actually working on projects, discovering that, uh, there is no, su there really is no such thing. First of all, you have no control over what, like memes are a perfect example of this. You, you have, have you ever tried to make a meme? Oh my God. The things that you think are so clever never stick. It's, it's really hard uh, to, to make things that are long lasting or that can actually kind of punch into the, the greater group think of the world. And in that same way, the projects that I worked on, you know, the, the different games and things like that, I always, I always had this opinion that I needed to work on something that would be so huge, like, it would have to be recognized. But at the same time, I mean, it's just product that's consumed. It's like obsessing over making a cob of corn. You don't have, you don't have control over what becomes uh, timeless. So the best thing that i found that I can do is just try and make the things that I like to make and uh, find the people that enjoy what I like to make and that's it and not focus on anything else. Have I ever encountered burn burnouts, art block during the career? Uh, my burnouts and art block almost always came from personal expectations uh, that I put on myself that almost always were part of projects that I did, that I had very little control. Um, when you are working on something that, that you're pretty passionate about, that you really care about, it tends to be, that fold I made is awful. It tends to be a little bit easier to uh, just get up and get it going every day. But, the art, the traditional art block, writer's block thing that most people talk about is, it, I think it's kind of a philosophical thing where you think that there's, that there is some kind of muse or something that's happening there. And it's really, that's not, in my experience anyway, that's not really the case. It's more the idea that, uh, you know, you just show up, just sit down and show up and um, don't count on a muse. It's kind of like, it's kind of like what I was talking about when I first started, started the painting and we were talking about how to start the painting. And I said, just, just start going and trust that you can, that, that you have the experience and the know-how to get you there. When you're finding yourself in blocks and things like that, that's kind of the name of the game. That's going to be what helps get you out of it. So we're going to play a game here and I'm going to turn off a bunch of layers that I've just been painting and see if I actually made any improvements. And I don't think I did. Part of that's probably just me talking, but that's the last one. So I'm going to get rid of this layer. Take this layer and then it'll erase some of the stuff I didn't like out of it. Go back. Burnouts tend to happen also when you stop taking risks. Uh, I found for me that uh, it wasn't necessarily burnout, it's just you get bored. And how I dealt with that was let's make this, let's make these much flatter uh, and, and heavier. It was, I got bored with the process. Uh, one of the things that I figured out about myself, and this is, this is I think, really uh, one of the ways that you can help yourself the most is really master your own quirks. And one of my big biggest quirks in terms of work is I love figuring things out. And then once I have kind of a system figured out, I get bored of the thing. And this has been true of just about everything I work on. 
Um, I love the, the, the learning process, the discovery. And then once, it, once it's become systematic, that's when I'm ready to do something else. And that's been true of jobs I've had. Um, that's been true of just about everything. the light, when I zoom out, the light works a little bit better in that sense. I need to get the weight in there so they're very kind of pinched off at the bottom. Uh, there's an episode about imposter syndrome. Oh yes, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good one. I imagine I probably just covered most of it. <laughs> I'm stuck in my painting now. It's stuck before it stays. Uh, yeah, that, that last bit, that can be the tough part, like knowing that you have more to do, but for me, a lot of times the last bit, it's just that it's, I'm bored with the, I'm bored with the process and I end up getting stuck there. And that's when I end up procrastinating the most. You figure out wh why you're procrastinating and you can usually get past it. And for me, that's almost always it. I'm just bored. I don't, I don't want to do the busy work. with it all the time you deal with getting stuck at that 70% stage and, and okay well how about this to diagnose it what when when you've actually finished a painting what was it that got you over that hump Well, there you go. That's the, you've just discovered it. What you need is fresh eyes, which is fine. I do that too. It's actually one of the things I kind of like about doing these like weekly update style ske uh, sketches and paintings is you see them with fresh eyes. Just plan for that. Basically, that's all you got to do. And I imagine you already do. Um, you know what you're doing. Just just planning for the stages that you know, because you're knowing yourself. That's all it is, is you know uh, how your process works and your process involves you need a little time away from the finish. And so you just plan that in when you actually do your, uh, your scheduling. Yeah, uh, Irina, getting, you're having your, just a boredom of looking at a thing, I totally get that. Uh, that happens to me too, and I think it's a great way to approach it. Take that break. Uh, Ozzy, are you asking that of me or Irina?
Ah, okay, cool. Uh, I guess my family was somewhat supportive. Um, before I started doing art, I was into music, and uh, they they didn't actively stop me from doing that. So I guess that's a kind of support. Um, but I left home pretty young uh, for various reasons, and. Um, I got more into the art stuff when I was out on my own. <laughs> I'm still new to this streaming thing. <laughs> For me, everybody's just hanging out and talking. If uh, art is something that you want to do and you find that your family isn't supportive, see previous comment about limited amount of time on this planet and what makes you happy. You cannot please anybody else. Everybody's in a way responsible for their own happiness. Have I ever been to India? Uh, no, it's on my list. Um, uh, Indian specific artist. Hmm. I'm really bad with art names regardless. Uh, there's Indian art that I love. I'm particularly fond of Indian stories um, and culture. I just like other cultures, period, and find them very fascinating. Um, so like my, that short story that I wrote, uh, takes place in, it's a, sci a cyberpunk, um, science fiction story that takes place in Mumbai. And so I did a bunch of research and, uh, I think it's a fascinating, fascinating culture. Um, I know there's some really good 
I, I've seen some artists, both in Magic, but just illustrators in general, that come out of there, uh, and, and I don't know what cities, and they're top notch. I'm a big, I am a huge fan of when, uh, like, really popular techniques are adopted um, and then used to uh, accentuate uh, the individual cultures of the artists themselves. And I've seen that a lot out of uh, China, India, um, Korea. It's so awesome. Like cinema in particular in India. Holy crap. It's taken off. I love it. Korean cinema is on another level right now. I'm just going to scribble in right now. This is just for texture. I, I don't know exactly what this will be, but I just want to see how it looks. Do you have any favorite uh, Indian artists? Ozzy? Ah, awesome. Yeah, I remember Hazen.
Damn, the sun just came out and I'm having trouble seeing. <laughs> On the topic of being a cog in the machine, work, 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 achieve, you started watching Bobby Chu, who is awesome, he's really great. You start to get so stressed out because he's all about pushing yourself. And you already tend to be an, a workaholic. Yeah. Um, damn, that's, uh, that's a tough one. So much of that part of our industry, in particular, the, the more on the concept design side, in self-improvement and the, and the autodidact method, you know, the self-teaching, you can put so much pressure on yourself. Not to say that, that uh, when I was in school, there wasn't a shitload of pressure, um, but it's the idea that the idea that if you're working, that, it, that, if, that if you're awake, you should be pressing forward on your, on your goal is a tough one. And I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier about time. I know uh, there is absolute truth in what he says in that the time that you spend, uh, the more time you spend and the more frequently, the faster this will all happen. But then the question becomes is like the faster towards what? Um, if, if you set yourself at a certain pace, uh, specifically a, a high speed one, that's, that's like very, um, potentially toxic like this, you're going to end up burnt out faster. Uh, you want to find the pace that's right for you and do your best not to compare yourself to other artists that are excelling quickly. Um, so you got triggered a lot, especially when you're saying, how many times do you look out of the window and just stare? Uh, actually, I think, um, I think you've, you've got the right of it, that it's actually really good for the brain not to think so much. Um, I think that it, you know, from my personal experience, again, this has to do with a lot of the choices that I've made over the over the years. That uh, if if your system for self improvement is built on comparison uh, as the only way that you're measuring your value, uh, it's going to result in burnout. It's totally doable and everybody can do it. And, and maybe in, in a way, everybody should do it uh, at least once in their life, just to, know, just to know themselves and know what's healthy for themselves. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it's super sustainable, especially with family, especially with everything else in the world. There's just so much more stuff. And then there's also this idea that uh, if you're not spending time doing specifically uh, studies that are, are focused towards whatever it is you're wanting to do, then uh, you're wasting your time. And to that, I absolutely 100% disagree. Uh, a lot of the greatest, um, the greatest aspects of my voice in terms of my work come from my other interests that don't really have anything to do with creating art, like reading or, uh, oh shit, it cut out? Where did we cut out? Sorry guys. Where'd I lose you? Oh shit. <laughs> so a good chunk of that you lost. Okay. Um, basically my point is just that, uh, you're potentially setting yourself up for a burnout. If you approach, um, your self-improvement only in this way that, uh, any time spent, uh, not focusing on your career is wasted time. And then I was also saying that in, in regard to that also, uh, 
from my experience, time spent on other hobbies, on other interests, even just staring out the window can uh, help influence and improve your work. So a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that I've brought to the table as a designer, especially, have been as a result of my other interests that had nothing to do with art in particular, like reading, role-playing games, um, history, things like that. What you can do, and this is something that I did do for a long time, although I've gotten a little bit slacky about it. What you can do is create for yourself parameters by which you allow yourself to do other things so that you can do those other things within the parameters of self-improvement. For example, uh, when I finally got out of college, I got through, I got through college and then finishing out college and, and, uh, um, my early work, I still, I've always been a gamer. I love video games. Uh, I play probably an unhealthy amount of video games for a 40 year old man, but, uh, <laughs> I really love video games. I always have. And because it's what I do, it's, you know, it's a little bit more acceptable, I think, although I've still been made fun of it at times. Uh, but one of the things that I did in order to ensure that I could still play video games, but wasn't just getting lost in endless amounts of video games was I set rules for what I could play. So I decided the things that I could play needed to directly benefit my understanding of games, story or design. Uh, the, the, if the only reward for that game that I was playing was just being better at that game, then I couldn't play that particular game. So what that ended up doing was cutting out. I love FPSs, but I had to cut out uh, like multiplayer FPS games that uh, the only reward was just being being able to frag everybody. That that doesn't help. That doesn't help me grow on the artistic side, and it doesn't really contribute that much into what I could add to a project or ideas that I could develop myself. So then it became about other games that I love to play also. So I could focus on adventure games and story-based games, role-playing games, things like that. Set parameters for the things that you enjoy. So if you're staring out the window uh, and actually thinking about nothing at all is what you're enjoying, that's totally fine. Just give yourself a time limit. Allow yourself to zone out. Um, there is absolute argument, and I, I think I mentioned this before, there is absolute argument to be made for, and scientific evidence that proves that some of the greatest jumps in creativity happen in moments like those. So I think it's a good idea to zone out, um, especially if you're struggling with an idea or you're wanting to do something uh, for your work. I think to, to ignore the value of what, what that is called, you can look it up, passive mode uh, network thinking or passive mode thinking. Uh, spending time just not actively trying to solve problems, you'll be surprised to find, uh, can completely give you those creative uh, eureka moments. That's why all the great ideas come on the toilet or they all come in the shower. It's because you're, you're not actively thinking about the, a solution to your problem um, and you're actively doing something else that doesn't require any thought. So you can zone out. Zoning out is vital to, I think, a healthy creative mind. So in that, I disagree with Sir Bobby Chu a little bit, even though he is really great and I love him. It's so easy to make what we do stressful for ourselves. I recommend finding any way you can to avoid that. Like we were talking about last week, play. Spend the time trying to play. Um, discovery, that sort of thing. That's what's going to make this. That's what's going to keep you in this. It's what's going to keep you vital. It's going to keep you uh, from that feeling of utter burnout. You know what I'm saying?
yeah, that little, that painting you did came out great. And it, and it was totally fresh. It didn't look like anything you'd ever done. And it was great. I think uh, there's absolutely something to be said for that. That if you're making time for study, make that time also for play. Well, gang, I think I'm going to have to stop this. I have to, uh, I got some other stuff I got to finish. Um, and then, of course, our lesson. Uh, so I think we'll stop here and then come back to it next week. See how I'm feeling. I have a feeling I'm going to redo a lot of this body because it's too, I don't know, it's too gummy to me. It's got this kind of gross clay feeling to it. It's not really refined. So I'll probably go in and get rid of a, a lot of the rendering that I did and just chunk it back so that it's a little more like the face. But uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Um, I'm just going to think about it for a while. Well, not think about it, really. It's going to be uh, completely ignoring this thing. When I, This is a kind of a lesson for you, I guess. Um, I'm going to close this, close down this stream, and I will forget within 30 minutes that I did this. And that's how I manage this kind of thing. When you're talking about taking a break from something, forget it exists completely, utterly, and then come back and look at it and see how you feel about it, okay? Yeah, uh, thank you guys for hanging out. Um, again, uh, the only way I can keep doing this stuff is if I can get a, a bigger following and push more towards uh, Patreon and Gumroad. And the only way I can do that is with your guys' help. Please, please share your experience. And, and if you enjoy the paintings and things like that, let people know um, on uh, social media and things like that. And of course, give me a follow and subscribe on all that stuff. It, it all means the world to me that you guys are hanging out. So anyway, I will let you go and uh, we will meet again next week. I believe actually next week I might start out with uh, our crits. Um, so get on top of that. If you have a finished painting and you're a student plus tier, uh, post on our community page at uh, the Patreon at Izzy Medrano. And uh, I will I will grab that stuff and do crits. If it takes a whole session, it takes a whole session. And then we can get back to this painting the week after. We'll see. Uh, right now, I think there's only one in there. Anyway, uh, yeah. So we'll see you guys next week. As always, paint smart, paint sexy. Hi there. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because, like they did, you want to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not. You're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Light grammar is for language. Light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. 
until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson, I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode 2, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode 3, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes 5 through 8 are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable, and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration, just like I do for Magic the Gathering, from assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end. Each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy.